We'd like to thank uh, General Raymond for agreeing to do this session. We have something over 200 folks registered from all over the world, um, including students, faculty, staff, alumni, government representatives, and corporations. And we'd like this to be a discussion and question and answer. All of our questions and answers will be asked through the chat and I will uh, moderate the session. We will be recording this session and this session will be available afterwards. Thank you very much. Admiral Rogi, over to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, thank you, James, for that kind introduction and of course for hosting today. Uh, the NDU Foundation is one of the university's most important partners and their sponsorship of webinars like this is but one small aspect of that support. Now, this webinar marks our 11th National Security Briefing and it's through these kinds of discussions with experts like General Raymond uh, that we gain valuable perspectives on national and global security issues. I really want to emphasize that to every one of you joining us here today is also one of our partners because of our shared interest in the security of our nation. Much like the dialogue in our classrooms, these discussions enable us to come together and build an understanding of the different points of view that are essential to our education mission. Now, I see that many of you have participated in earlier briefings, so to you, welcome back. And for those of you today who are new, uh, joining us today who are new to this series, let me offer just a quick word about your National Defense University. I'm certain that this crowd appreciates that we live in an increasingly complex, dynamic, and uncertain world. The United States faces many competitors and threats to our security. In fact, competitors are investing heavily to try to erode our technological advantages. So it's really important that NDU be able to create intellectual advantage by developing leaders who can outthink our competitors. So it's NDU's mission to prepare today's rising national security leaders across military, government, and industry. NDU students will be the decision makers that our nation and our allies will depend upon tomorrow, from domains from the undersea to outer space. Our students are in equal parts military members of the U.S. Armed Services, civilians from U.S. government departments and agencies, and on our campus this year, we have over 120 international students from 65 friendly partner and allied nations. And if we do well at our education mission, then these students will graduate with the ability to launch the kinds of ideas that could preclude the need to launch weapons. And so the lasting measure of our success is in the peace and security enjoyed by the United States and our friends, partners, and allies. In the words of former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, Education is quite simply peace building by another name. It is the most effective form of defense spending there is. So let me then suggest that if you would want the leaders of your national security enterprise, the key decision makers contributing to your peace and security, if you would want them ideally to be well educated in how to do so, then you should not only be partners of NDU, but also our advocates. And I hope that that will encourage you all to learn more about the Chairman's University, your National Defense University. So now on behalf of uh, NDU, I want to thank General Jay Raymond for joining us to provide insight into the space domain and the United States Space Forces mission and initiatives and impact and contribution to national security. It's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce you all to General Jay Raymond, our nation's first Chief of Space Operations for the United States Space Force. General. Uh, good morning. Uh uh, Fritz and, and Dr. Schmong, thank you very much for uh, hosting me this today. And I'm really excited for the opportunity to, to be able to share a few thoughts. And what I thought I would do, if it's okay, is I'll start off by giving a, a few remarks just to set the uh, stage for what I hope will become a, a robust uh, dialogue back and forth, because I really would like to, to engage in that in that conversation. I, as I view this, you know, today represents probably one of the most defining uh, periods in our national defense uh, posture. Uh, there's probably that 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 environment. Probably we haven't seen that kind of significant change probably in a generation. And, and in space, it might be a couple of generations. Uh, what I know is that space under my, underpins every bit of our national power, uh, and and we are we are strongest when that space domain is stable, secure, uh, for our nation to fuel capabilities that fuel our American way of life and for capabilities that fuel our American way of war. It is clear today uh, that space is a war fighting domain just like air, land, and sea. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in another session, that you could I couldn't have said that five or six years ago in a public setting. We didn't want space to become a war fighting domain, and we, and we still frankly don't today, but adversaries have a vote. And clearly Russia and China 
are developing capabilities to uh, the kind of two pieces. One is to uh, have uh, space capabilities for their own use. So they have the same advantage that we have enjoyed over the last uh, decades of integrating space uh, to great effect. And then the second thing that they're developing is developing a pretty significant uh, set of threats uh, that would threaten our ability to access our space capabilities. Everything from reversible jamming on one end all the way up to uh, kinetic destruction on, on the other end. And so uh, the United States over the course of the last year and a little bit uh, did two things. We reestablished we re uh, United States Space Command uh, as the war fighting uh, command for space. It used to be part of U.S. Strategic Command up until uh, August of 2019 when we took it out from underneath U.S. Strategic Command and established a separate combatant command. Uh, I had the privilege of leading that combatant command up until this past August. And uh, General Jim Dickinson uh, is now the commander of U.S. Space Command. A couple months later, in December of 2019, a few months later, in de December of 2019, we es we established the United States Space Force to elevate the organized, train, and equip uh, pieces of space uh, uh, from a major command underneath the United States Air Force as part of the United States Air Force to its own independent service. And today what you have is very analogous to the Marine Corps model where on the on the Navy side, you have a secretary of the Navy with a um, commandant of the Marine Corps and a chief of naval operations on the, on the Department of the Air Force side. Now you have a secretary of the Air Force that has a chief of staff of the Air Force and a chief of space operations. Um, as I look at, you know, why would why would a, a country stand up uh, a separate service? The reason why we did was to elevate space to the level of importance to our national security. And and if you look at what independent services need to do, uh, there's a handful of things, in my opinion. First, you have to develop your own people. And that's why this session today is so important with National Defense University, because you, you're a critical part of that education of, of our joint and coalition force. Uh, the second thing you have to do is you have to have your own doctrine. And we just published our own doctrine. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, I'd urge you to get a copy of it. It's called Space Power. It's an independent view of space power as, as our doctrine. Very similar to what the Air Force did in 1947, leading up to 1947. There was an Air Corps tactical school where experts got together and developed a theory of air power uh, that grew into then uh, the foundation of this service. So we've done that on the space side. The other thing that you have to do is you have to have your own budget. And, and over this course of this past year, we've taken all the dollars that were associated with space out of the Air Force and put them into the Space Force. And we have our own budget. We just submitted our, our uh, POM and our budget for the first time as an independent service over the last couple of months. The other thing you have to do is you have to design your force. And so uh, one of the things that our big focus area is on this coming year is to do that force design uh, that brings unity of effort across the Department of Defense and with our allied partners um, to be able to develop a force that can uh, operate effectively in a contested environment. And then uh, fifth, once you design that force, you have to present those forces to a combatant command. And so we're also working a uh, new force presentation methodology because today the way space forces are presented are, is through the air component. Uh, and it's really focused on the CENTCOM fight, not a national defense strategy focused uh, uh, conflict. And so uh, those are kind of the five things that I see an independent service needs to do. To get after those five things, we've got uh, some lines of effort that we're working. First of all, we're gonna build this, this service. And the first year has really all been about creating this service. And I use the term create or invent this service purposefully because it's not just business out is how we've done business in the past. It's building something new with a clean sheet of paper. And so we built the service to be light, lean, and agile. We do not want to be big. We have to go fast. If you look at the challenges that we face in the space domain with the size and the scope of, of the domain, you have to move at speed. And so you've seen us do the largest restructure of the space enterprise in our history and have flattened already two layers of command uh, and flattened our staff here at the Pentagon from a planning planned number of over 1,000 to to a plan number that gets us to 600 over, over the next next couple of years. Um, we're also needing to develop joint and coalition warfighters. And again, this is why NDU, it's so important that I talk to NDU. Um, I will tell you the one thing I can say for certain 
is that nobody that comes to your schools understands the space domain to the level that they need to understand space domain to be successful in their business. And it's not just space, it's the whole multi-domain aspect of, of warfare going forward. And you uh, have a, an opportunity to be the leaders in that in that effort, and we need you to be the leaders in that effort. It requires, um, from my perspective, in the space domain, developing space operators that have a better better understanding of the joint, uh, uh, the joint environment and uh, to have what you and I might consider more traditional joint warfighters that have a better understanding of space. We have to build capabilities at operationally relevant speeds. And in your uh, school uh, schools, you can help us with that as well. Uh, we are moving too slow. And, and uh, if you look at how long it takes us to build a clone of a capability that we already have on our orbit, uh, we're talking five to six years for a clone, not fast enough. And so we want to capitalize on uh, the, again, a bad word to use in the commercial, in the space business, but the explosion of commercial space companies uh, and our large uh, partners in, in the in uh, defense contractors to be able to move at speed. One of the ways that we're going to get it after that is to shift towards a digital digital engineering model. We want to build this service as a digital service up front. Uh, that means having a digital headquarters, having uh, people on the force that are digitally fluent, and third, developing this uh, digital engineering and adopting this digital engineering standard as our model for all acquisitions going forward, and that's what we've done. Um, the other thing that we have to do is we have to integrate with partners, and we've got to integrate uh, with our joint and coalition partners. Uh, historically, uh, for for our allies that are on the net today, our partners, uh, we haven't had the partnerships in space that we've needed uh, to, because in the past, we really didn't need to. It was a benign, peaceful domain, and there wasn't a threat. That's not the case today, and we're hard at work at developing those partnerships, and I'm really proud uh, of, of that line of effort. It's probably the area that we've made the most significant gains uh, over the last several years. Um, again, I appreciate the opportunity. What I'd like to do now is use that to kind of prime the pump for questions and, and look forward to a good dialogue as we go forward. Thank you. General Raymond, this is uh, Bill Bender. I'm okay. late to join, but um, certainly uh, have been in on your comments here. I've had all kinds of challenges over here at Lighthouse today as a sponsor of this event. And so, uh, but I have had an opportunity to collect a number of questions that I'd like to uh, share with you, if I may. Sure, I'd, I'd love to. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, a lot of interest, obviously, in SDA, MDA, SMC for inclusion and use of Intel community data. I know that you, uh, in your role as the Air Force Space uh, Command Commander, really inspired a lot of partnership. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the importance of that in some of our joint programs and projects and specifically as it relates to Space Force working with NRO? Absolutely. Well, I would, uh, first of all, we've never, first of all, it's great to see and glad, glad uh, your, your computer. Jumped. Yeah, we got it. Got up to speed. Uh, and got on the net. I, uh, first of all, uh, the partnership that we enjoy today with the National Reconnaissance Office has never been better. We worked that very, very hard uh, over the course of the last handful of years. And, uh, uh, you know, today we share uh, a strategy, we share a conops. Uh, we share an operations center. We share people. You know about a uh, you know, significant number of space professionals from from the space force and the air force historically are, work over at the national reconnaissance office. We uh, um, we're also sharing programs. You know we were going to build a program on the air force side when when, I, when we were still in the air force uh, that wasn't going to meet our needs, and they, the NRO was building a capability that would. And so we killed ours and, and shifted uh, dollars to them. And so that integration is is really, really uh, strong. Uh, what's driving us together largely is the threat. And so if you look at the NRO mission set, the NRO has its distinct mission set, DOD space has its distinct mission set, and where we come together is in this protect and defend. Uh, going forward, I think we need to broaden that relationship even greater. Uh, and that if you look at the mission sets, now that smaller satellites are, are more operationally relevant, I think there's, uh, areas or room for the Space Force to be in, for example, some of the tactical ISR uh, mission areas. And so you're going to see that relationship continue uh, continue to be uh, one of our one of the strongest. And again, we operate very seamlessly with the with the NRO. 
So thank you for that. Um, I, I read very recently that a bipartisan group of House lawmakers uh, announced the creation of Space Force Caucus, uh, focused on advocating for the new service and educating lawmakers and staffers about the service's objectives and priorities. And then uh, the Senate, likewise, uh, established its own Space Caucus about a month ago. And so, um, Obviously, they're serving to advocate for U.S. Space Force and the vital role that the new service plays in maintaining space power, as you've discussed. What specific advocacy uh, do you believe would be most important in the earliest days of the stand-up of the command uh, in your relations with Congress? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, you know, the, back on 20 December when the president signed the National Defense Authorization Act, he, he signed our birth certificate. And so Congress, uh, by, with bipartisan support, uh, uh, wrote this act uh, that, that uh, you know, again, established our service. And we've had really strong bi uh, bipartisan support as we've gone forward. Um, I, have, I have told both uh, House, uh, House members in the House of Representatives and members in the Senate uh, that we want to have a very close partnership and that we uh, frequently provide them updates uh, going forward. Um, in fact, in the law, it, it mandates uh, uh, updates every 60 days. We're, we're uh, overachieving on that front. I, I don't want any daylight. As we build this service, um, that you know, the Congress gave us a lot of uh, homework right up front. The first thing that they said to do was uh, develop an independent acquisition strategy uh, for space, and 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 we've done that. They told us to do a human capital management plan, and we've done that. They told us to do a study on how to best integrate reserve the reserve component into this service. We've done that, and so uh, we are working very very closely with Congress on on those and on uh, uh, just standard programmatic uh, uh, issues and. Uh, uh, providing greater uh, fidelity on the challenges and the threats that we currently see in space. And so as we look to build this service, we have an opportunity again to start with a clean sheet of paper. Uh, we want to be really bold in that in that vision, and it's going to require support from Congress, and we're working very closely, um, keeping them informed on, on the work that we've done. So thank you for that. Um, you know, you mentioned that the overall galvanizing uh, point with with the stand up of U.S. Space Force is that of protect and defend. And although space is a global commons, it's also a domain of intense international competition. You alluded to that in your remarks as well. So how do we maintain just maybe a couple of high level thoughts, our competitive edge over a rapidly growing Chinese space program that I've read and you would probably know much better is assessed to uh, overtake or at least compete directly with the U.S. and Russia in five years. Is the U.S. Space Force pursuing partnership with members of the EU, for example, for innovation and combined advantage beyond what we have with the uh, today's International Space Station? Any thoughts there? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, we are working. So we first of all, we're the best in the world along with our partners, we're the best in the world in space. And and that shouldn't be lost on anybody. Uh, the reason why the Space Force and U.S. Space Command uh, was established was because competitors were moving fast. This is this is a critical part of the national defense strategy and to compete to turn win. And so our job is to make sure that we don't get overtaken, that we stay ahead of that, uh, that threat. And uh, I'm convinced that we're going to be able to do that. We're going to do that in very close partnership with our partners. I talked about before, uh, just a little bit ago that that we didn't have the partners that we needed in space as, or we didn't have partners in space historically because we in on the military side because we really didn't need them uh we are working that very very hard in fact when we stood up u.s space command when we planned that command i activated our i established a, a combined force space component command out of vandenberg so the operational component to u.s space command is a combined command first time ever um we uh, have opened up significantly more training uh, uh, opportunities for our allied partners. We we play war games together with our allied partners. We're developing norms of behavior uh, uh, with our allied uh, uh, partners. We um, are now looking to not just do, we share data 
uh, broadly with our allied partners. Our, our operation centers are connected together. Uh, and in the future, uh, not just in the future, and today, uh, and more so in the future, we want to share programs. And so uh, we just, for example, uh, put uh, uh, came up to an agreement with Norway to put two hosted payloads on Norwegian satellites. That saved us almost $900 million. And because their their satellite program was a little ahead of us in timing, it will get us capability onto orbit faster than if we would have had to build the satellites ourselves. We're putting uh, a hosted payload on a Japanese, uh, what's called a QZSS satellite, which is a GPS augmentation satellite, putting an SSA payload on that satellite. Again, uh, we're developing the C2 systems together because our operation centers are linked. So I couldn't be more uh, excited for where we're headed with our partners. And we think that's a critical part of this competition uh, going forward. And, uh, and likewise, you've been very uh, vocal on the, you know, the fact that the space force needs to be a disruptor innovator. You talked to that again in your, one of your lines of effort. Uh, to drive the significant and rapid change that's required, rapid being the key, the need for speed. How do you see robotics, autonomy, artificial intelligence advancements, and, and things of that nature in this digital transformation uh, world that we're living in, uh, playing in the future for space operations, and what strategic investments in particular around R&D do you believe must be made in the next two to four years? Yeah, I, so... Not only is it important to the Space Force, it's, I, my personal opinion is we're going to be leading that effort. Uh, it, it's critical to our to successful operations in the domain. Just think of the size of the domain. You know, uh, if you look at the, the UCP for, for the U.S. Space Command mission, it, it's an, the, the UCP uh, assigns the U.S. Space Command with an AOR. In fact, when U.S. Space Command stood up, it, was, it stood up as a geographic combatant command. It has an AOR, and that AOR is 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface and higher. That is, that, that is huge. And if you look at the operations that, that happen in that domain, uh, whether it's military operations, commercial operations, civil operations, um, or intelligence operations, those operations happen at a speed uh, that is uh, way faster than anything that happens on, on the sea or on the land or in, or in the air. Uh, we're talking, you know, objects in space traveling 17,500 miles an hour just to stay into orbit, just to stay in orbit. If you look at threats that come from the ground, like China did in 2007, you know, uh, launched a missile to blow up a satellite that reaches low Earth orbit in a matter of minutes. And so you can't operate in that domain in a contested space domain without the tools and capabilities that that you that you described. And we want to be on the front line, front line of that. Our first big step. Uh, going forward is this digital engineering to get us the ability to go fast in digital engineering. We want to get industry there with us uh, to help us get there. Um, I think autonomy is going to be a significant uh, piece uh, for uh, for the Space Force. And I think reusability is also going to be significant, uh, uh, provide a significant advantage for the Space Force going forward. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the, the other thing, Bill, I'd say the ability, you know, you heard, you've heard the the uh, the joint and co uh, joint forces talk about JAD C two, you know that the ability to connect sensor to shooter. Now the space force developed. We we don't have a C two system that we need uh, in space today. So we've been building this for a couple of years, and and we we built the data infrastructure for that JAD C two. All came out of the space force and. and uh, uh, we call it the UDL. So we are all in on that, uh, on JADC2 as well, having the standards to be able to connect sensor to shooter across multiple domains and be able to come up with uh, decisions at the speed that we're going to need them to be successful is is where we're headed. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you bring up JADC2. It, it seems a perfect storm in terms of between the chairman and the vice chairman and all the service chiefs, as we understand it. And sometimes you have to pick it up in separate periodicals or whatever, but uh, every service chief is aligned on the need for JADC2 to be successful, yeah. uh, stay inside of the uh, enemy's OODA loop, if you will. And so um, I take it from your your comments that as a service chief, you are also uh, very much, you know, to that way of thinking as a number one priority. 
I'm sorry, uh, repeat that last bit. The, with, with Jad C2 specifically yeah. as a high priority uh, yeah. from where you sit and you're right. part of the larger enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, in fact, I would say it's our highest priority. Okay, great. Um, so again, you mentioned uh, very briefly in your remarks that um, the Space Force, while a reality now is just building, clearly under the wing of the Air Force initially in terms of relationship, but now separate and distinct. Uh, and you mentioned the resemblance, if you will, to the Marines and the Navy. If you talk to a Marine, uh, they're going to talk about the significance of their independence in terms of their history, their imagery, uh, the perception that people have as Marine, uh, every ma Marine being a rifleman and so on and so forth. Uh, how can you ensure that the U.S. Space Force has a strong, independent, identifiable presence in national life? And do you see that as being significant where you are today? I, abs I absolutely do see it as significant. In fact, uh, uh, Chief Goldfein and I talked a lot about this, and, and Chief Brown and I continue to talk about it. But you know, when we started this, Chief Goldfein and I talked about uh, you know wanting to get this right. And he he has a story where he talked about he has two granddaughters that are the same age, and you know, in 20 years from now, when they graduate from the Air Force Academy, one of them's going to join the Space Force, and one of them's going to join the Air Force. And if we do this right, it's, these services are going to be built on a foundation of trust, and so we're committed to doing that. The other piece of this, though, is that we are independent. And I laid out the five things that we have to do, in my opinion, they have to do separate if you're going to be an independent service. And so there is that level of independence. And there is a risk uh, that the, the Air Force could hug us too closely. And so uh, that would not be helpful to us or them. Uh, the Air Force is going to need us uh, to be an independent service with the full weight of an independent service to be able to provide them what they need to be able to support their missions, as is all the other services. So as we're as we're planning this, uh, you know, the way the, the Space Force was co was constructed in law was that really the only thing that comes into the Space Force are space operators, engineers, acquisition experts, cyber, some uh, cyber experts and some software programmers. Everything else we're going to rely on the Air Force for all the support uh, functions, you know, um, security forces, civil engineering. We are focusing on the space superiority mission and, and being able to provide space capabilities to our joint and coalition partners that are assured. And so there's always going to be this close partnership, but we are independent and we're making sure that we plan this, that we that we purposefully build that independence where it's needed and that we rely and and where it's not where it's not needed that there's a seamless partnership with the Air Force. So if I could just follow on there, because your initial uh, strategy doctrine for space space power uh, really talked significantly about space superiority um, as part of that future doctrine. Um, what what doctrinal shifts, if you will, do you foresee coming that deviate from the current? doctrine established in Air Force or joint doctrine? Yeah, the, the, we've had doctrine, space doctrine for years, and it was largely, if you look at it, it was largely about taking space capabilities and integrating them into the joint and coalition fight and making those other domains better. Um, and so you know, that largely stemmed from Desert Storm and from you know coming out of Desert Storm where we first integrated space capabilities into the fight uh, in, an, in an AOR. Uh, it, it, it's, it proved very advantageous. And, you know, as a young captain at that time, uh, you know, after Desert Storm, General Horner, who was the, the JFAC for Desert Storm, they, he got reassigned as the commander of Air Force Space Command. And that was purposeful. That was bringing the warfighter in that just had the experience of, of just beginning the integration of space into theater operations and trying to take that to a new level. Almost my entire career since that time was spent integrating space into those into the into that fight and we've done the we've done spectacularly nobody can touch us on that i mean if you look at how we've we've integrated there's nothing we do as a joint and coalition force today that isn't enabled by that integration the challenge is our adversaries have had a front row seat on it and uh they have are developing threats uh to to deny us that advantage and so it's no longer good enough just to think about space as a benign domain and how do I integrate space in this benign domain. You have to treat it as a warfighting domain and you have to look at what else can space do besides just making the other domains uh, more effective. 
We want to continue to do that, but we also want to develop independent options from the space domain, uh, which we think can help amplify the deterrence message uh, as a beginning. So um, how would you imagine or, or envision uh, planning to use commercial space assets? Um, there's been this proliferation, for example, in the LEO constellations. Uh, how comfortable are you with using such assets first relying on, you know, sort of dedicated military developed and deployed uh, space systems like you'd be used to coming up? See huge opportunities with that going forward. Uh, historically, where we've leveraged commercial industry is twofold. One is on commercial launch, and if you look at the launch, our launch capabilities today, we buy we buy services, if you will. So, uh, with both the ULA and SpaceX today, um, and the other area that we rely very heavily on is commercial, big, large commercial communication satellites. Those were the things that were um, viable in commercial industry. Now that technology has allowed smaller satellites to be more operationally relevant, hence the, the what you just talked about, proliferated LEO constellations, um, we think there is a great uh, role to be played by those. And so this force design that we're going to develop is all is all about, uh, you know, where what's the best orbit to do the mission? Uh, how uh, uh, how fast can you get it on orbit? What's the cost and can you protect it? And if you balance those attributes, I think what you're gonna see is you're gonna come up with a hybrid hybrid approach. Uh, and it's not just gonna be the, the one-off big, very expensive handmade wooden shoes uh, architecture. Uh, it will be more proliferated architecture that's, that's more defendable going forward. So, um... Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, I talked up front about uh, the other thing it does is it helps us go faster. And so if you look at, um, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that if you look at, if we wanted to buy a clone today of a, let's say a GPS satellite, uh, an exact replica of what we have on orbit today, it's going to take us a handful of years just to do that, just to buy a clone. And commercial industry is building satellites uh, at, at a pace much faster, much, much faster. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, designing, building, and launching uh, hundreds and hundreds of satellites uh, in, in, in months rather than years. We want to capitalize on that business model where it makes sense. Not all mission areas, it doesn't make sense for all mission areas, but in a lot of them, it does. So, so maybe switching topic a little bit, but I think uh, very much tied to, uh, you know, sort of commercial uses in space and, and a shared responsibility in our national security enterprise. The question comes in from a commander, Mike uh, Bull Trumbull, and it's, I, I would just as a service chief ask for your reaction to this and maybe a few thoughts. Uh, he says, you mentioned the intent to establish light, lean and agile team. Light and lean historically is challenging, uh, given the concern about being realistically achievable in light of the growing great power competition, according to the NDS. And so some might argue it's viewed as a tactic to get on, you know, sort of some kind of funding reality, I believe is the point that he's making. And he's just kind of wondering in terms of the receptance to, um, you know, funding what you're being asked to do and building out the force and then um, you know sort of developing a future where we keep our competitive advantage in space yeah, so i think there's a balance we I, as i mentioned up front and i and i believe this in all sincerity we do not want to be big uh, i i've dealt a lot with commercial industry and one of the things that i hear every time i meet with the ceo of a of a of a innovative commercial industry company is that big is slow and we don't want to be slow. And the reason why we don't want to be slow is because of the domain in which we operate. I, I told you, we start out, you know, the Air Force had planned for about eight months before the law was signed establishing the Space Force, the, the Space Force had done planning. And the plan was to have 1,035 people on the space staff in the headquarters at the Pentagon. And I, you know, 20 December, I was named the CSO and I inherited this plan and I started reviewing it and I said, okay, what are 1,035 people going to do? I mean, you and I, you and I served as uh, partners here on the air staff 
a few years ago, and there was nowhere near that uh, on their staff as it relates to space. And so the, the challenge is you can be too light and too lean and you can't be effective, uh, uh, but you can be too big and the, the challenge is hitting the sweet spot. And I think uh, as we operate in a, in a Department of Defense, you have to have enough mass to be able to operate effectively uh, inside the bureaucracy but we also want to be a leader of, of change and be an incubator for change. And so we whittled that down 40%, that staff down 40%. And we're not even, you know, we're still growing. We, we've only got a couple hundred folks on staff today. It'll grow to 600 over the next couple of years. On the budget side, we inherited the budget that the Air Force had for space. And so uh, we've already carved that out. And, and every bit of those dollars are now part of the Space Force dollars. And we've, we've submitted our first POM and first budget uh, to Congress, so it's purpose. It's purposefully being built as being small, based on the the strategic environment that we face in space. We'll see if we have it right. If I can press on that, and this is you'll, you'll probably have to correct me to a hundred percent, but it, it seems as if the at least the initial majority of your force came from the Air Force by design, but uh, that is certainly not the long term plan, right? So the associated subordinate organizations and units as they are further developed and built out, you mentioned your headquarters size, but what is the, what can you share with us in terms of the service uh, complements from the other services and how large is U.S. Space Force currently envisioned to be in total once complete? Yeah, so um uh, for, let me start with the that last part uh, today on so on on uh, one December when the president signed the the National Defense Authorization Act establishing the U.S. Space Force that night uh, we took Air Force Space Command which was a major command of the United States Air Force and we assigned those forces to the United States Space Force there's si roughly sixteen thousand people that were assigned to that and then since then. Uh, we went across the Air Force and said, okay, what else is the Air Force doing in space that, what, that wasn't part of Air Force Space Command? For example, Air Education and Training Command doing the development pieces for space. We pulled that over. Some intelligence functions we pulled over. Uh, cy some cyber uh, capabilities we pulled over. I mean, we went through the rest of the Air Force Research Lab capabilities we pulled over. Warfare Center capabilities we pulled over. And so we, t we excise space out of every piece of the Air Force. Now, in doing so, you can't break the Air Force. You know, when you stand up a Space Force, although there was no sheet music on how to stand up a service, because we haven't done it since 1947, there's no checklist, what you can do is break the Air Force. We worked, as I mentioned, we worked really, really hard over the course of the last couple of decades of integrating space into everything that we do. And so now what will happen is General Brown uh, and the Air Force will say, okay, Space Force, I need X number of space experts at the Warfare Center. And then we'll assign those folks back to them. Uh, for that for that assignment. So we've, we've done that. The uh, Department of Defense's uh, goal is to have a preponderance of space capabilities in the United States Space Force. We stood up a service for a reason. That also means you can't break the Army and you can't break the Navy. You can't break the Marine Corps in doing so. So we've been going through an effort to study um, what should come over and what shouldn't come over uh, so we don't do harm. And uh, we've come up uh, with a really solid plan. We're about the 98, 97% complete. Uh, there's a couple little pieces we're doing some more analysis on, and then I would expect a decision here in the very near term of what other pieces will come over from the other services. But you're right today, uh, the Space Force largely has come out of the Air Force with some um, augmentees from other services to help us get going. So close to a, um, you know, sort of a final decision there and some announcements in terms of the other service components. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and you mentioned early on in your answer to that question about taking peace parts out of the Air Force Air Education and Training Command. There's a question from a Lieutenant Colonel Sanders uh, within the Space Force as to any plan for an independent education outside of Air University. How is that looking? Yeah, absolutely. There is. Uh, as I as I mentioned, I think one of the things uh, that you have to do as an independent service is develop your own people. And so um what we've done initially um uh, so for example basic military training we just had our first seven recruits that got recruited for the space force show up at basic training and they're basically going through the air force basic training but we've we've modified it slightly for those airmen as a, an initial piece 
Um, for Air Command and Staff College, as another example, we stood up a couple years ago something called the Shriver Scholars, and we took a seminar uh, that was, you know, there, I, don't quote me on the number of seminars, there's like 40 seminars at ACSC, and one of those uh, what became a space focused seminar. And so they would, they would uh, go through ACSC, but would focus, they'd have independent space focused areas as well. We've doubled that uh, this past year to two seminars. We're going to double that again to four, which is which gets us to about 40 or 50 folks. And then we're going to split that off uh, as an independent uh, school focusing on developing uh, air command staff college. We're doing the same stair step approach uh, for Air War College. We just set up for the first time uh, a seminar focused on space, and uh, we'll, we'll do that. Um, you look at... Uh, uh, Airman Leadership School. Yeah, those are assigned at bases in, in the Air Force. And so if you're on a space force base in the future, that Airman Leadership School will be designed to teach you about uh, leadership uh, as it relates to as it relates to uh, the space force uh, priorities. Uh, NCO Academy, there's an NCO Academy at, at uh, Peterson Air Force Base. We're going to make that the uh, NCO Academy for Space Force. And so if you're a member of the Space Force, you will go to that academy. And so we are, it, you know, none of this, it, all this can't happen overnight. We can't just flip the switch and say, okay, we're up and running, but we've got an incremental uh, approach uh, to phase those into a independent uh, capability to be able to develop the, the Space Force leaders that we need in the future. And it won't, just like all other service schools, it won't be all space experts. We'll have Air Force and Army and Navy and Marines and, and coalition uh uh, partners in that in that class with us as well. So a, a similar question, and, and maybe a softball. Um, can you tell me, in terms of the service acquisition executive, has that decision been made? Is it separate and distinct from the Air Force, or is it co-joined for the foreseeable future? Well, how's that developing? Well, the law is the law is really clear. It says we're going to have separate SAE, and it gives a time frame of when that is. I think that's. Uh, beginning of fiscal year 23. So that's what's in the law and, and uh, that's the way we're headed. Okay. Um, you've mentioned the need or concern to protect and defend space assets as actually as the galvanizing reason for a separate uh, space force. How do you view the trade-off of protecting assets versus making them sort of replaceable, reconstitutable, which is, you know, always talked about as a a possible way to skin this. Yeah, so uh, that's all part of this force design, Bill, and that's all work that has to be done. And you're right, there's a there's a trade off there. Um, on do you build big disposable lighters that you can just launch, and if they fail, you just you know launch another batch, or right. are they more significant? And I think again, it, it, you have to. It has to be thought through as it as it relates to the mission that those satellites are doing, the orbits that they're in, the threats that they may face. Uh, and so all of that then gets gets rolled into uh, the calculus when you then build this force design. One of the things that the Space Force is working on as we build this design is to, to bring unity of effort across the department. And so, you know, leading up to this, the establishment of the Space Force, you know, Congress would highlight the 65 different organizations uh, that had some role in space acquisition. Now, there's like 30 something different organizations that that uh, have some kind, in, either internal to the department or out, external to the department, that have some kind of role in act, or architectures. And so we really believe you stood up a service for a reason. That should be the that service should be the the leading voice in that. Partnered with all the other. I mean, it is, this isn't just hey, Jay Raymond's opinion is this. It's bringing everybody together and having the analytical underpinnings to 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 support that decision. But we want to get an arc uh, a force design uh, that that uh, meets the needs of the Joint Coalition Warfighters that we support and also is defendable. And that's the hard work that we have going forward uh, this next year. So for those interested in uh, joining Space Force as you develop out, you know, the, the force design that you're talking about, um, can you maybe describe uh, it initially and then the continuum over time as to what we would expect our space operational force to be uh, doing into the future in terms of where they would be deployed to? Are they deployed in place for the foreseeable future? How does that work out for us? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, is the, 
my leadership has been very clear to me at the highest levels. Uh, we're building a space force, not just for today, but for 100 years from now. You know, people will talk about uh, uh, culture and even just think about, you know, the service that we came from the Air Force and what we were like in 1947 uh, compared to the Air Force of today. Right. And so we have to build a service that, that can do what it needs to do today, but also has the, the, the vision of where it might go. And, and uh, uh, so today... Uh, largely the forces that we have are employed in place. Uh, they're, they're systems that don't, uh, that don't deploy. We have, we have capabilities that we do deploy, but the vast majority are employed in place. Um, I do think I get asked this a lot about, do you see a role for, for space force folks in the future in the, you know, in the domain? And I do, I think, I mean, maybe not today or tomorrow or 10 years from now, but I do believe if you look towards, uh, a space economy that's going to be, you know, over a trillion dollars uh, between here and and, uh, the, and the moon. I really believe there's going to be a role for for enhanced security in that domain, and the role of the space force is to provide that stability uh, across the domain, so commercial companies and and nations can flourish. And so, uh, I do. I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think it's tomorrow, but I wouldn't rule it out that there'll be a, an increased presence in the domain uh, from Space Force folks going forward. Well, I would certainly echo that in talking to young people who were fired up about joining Space Force. Uh, some of those are interested because they think they will be deploying to space. And um, it's actually refreshing to hear that in a future fight, they may very well uh, have that opportunity. Yeah, we're gonna, one of the cool things, you know, on our birthday on the 20th, of, you know, our birthday is the 20th of December, one of the things that we're planning, if, if all goes well, is uh, one of the astronauts that will that's about to launch uh, here uh, on the next SpaceX launch up to the International Space Station is a is a is an airman, and we're looking to uh, swear him into the Space Force from the International Space Station. Hope that hope all all goes well on that. But I do see, I do see in the future that that uh, that could be uh, that that's a future that that would be real. Today, uh, our focus largely is making sure that we can provide our joint coalition partners the space capabilities they have become to rely on very, very heavily. Uh, those capabilities provide us great advantage and to make sure that you know, the analogy I use is the light switch. When you walk in a room and you turn on the light, you hit the light switch, the lights always come on. Uh, we need to make sure that you know when you go into the room and you need space and you hit the light switch, it's always there. And so that's our focus. That's uh, competing, deterring, and winning as part of the national defense strategy. I think the standing up, the establishment of the Space Force was part of that implementation of the NDS. Uh, and I, I really believe uh, uh, we will provide significant, significant advantage to our nation and to our coalition partners that we, that we, uh, that we are, uh, deeply uh, respect and need. So General Raymond, we're getting close to the end, probably a question or two uh, more, if you can indulge, if your time allows, and I'll hand back to uh, James Schmeling at the end for a couple of final comments. Um, back to the discussion around commercial space assets. Um, the DOD is occasionally offering space capabilities to civilians, a great example being GPS, maybe the most obvious example. Do you foresee future defense space capabilities being offered to the public? And um, in, you know, if we use GPS as the example, are you comfortable with some of those capabilities basically becoming ubiquitous to the American way of life or really, you know, the industrialized world's way of life similar to GPS such that uh, the dependencies are so critical that you really can't live without it. Uh, any thoughts there? Of course. I mean, that's, that's you know, space is ubiquitous. Space is, uh, fuels our American way of life. It's not just GPS. I mean, you think about weather satellites and communication satellites. and right. That's just what, that's who we are. And so I absolutely see that continuing going forward. I think as technology advances and we get innovative people thinking about the domain, uh, there'll be even more things that, that, uh, are out there that will that will uh, provide benefit uh, to the average person on the on the planet. You know, the the average person might not understand just how reliant they are on space. Mm -hmm. they, they, it's just because the light switch is always on. Uh, but but uh, I 
I mean, there's everyday uh, human on the on the planet Earth, if you will, uh, relies on space capabilities routinely. I mean, almost uh, everything that they do with the with the and GPS is the great example of it's more than the blue the dot that tells you where it is, but it's the the timing synchronization for all the all the uh, information age business that we're in. Uh, it, it it's just part of our it's part of our American way of life. And I believe that there'll be other capabilities that will develop in, in the future that will will do similar things. So I'm going to do my level best to tie together three questions, um, all that are really touching on your mission sets. Uh, one, talking about and confronting the emerging, uh, they call them gray area tactics by our competitors in space. Uh, and then, you know, just doctrinally around the various priority mission sets, if our space assets are attacked, what kind of retaliation could be uh, considered and where, you know, how does that develop over time uh, where, where you're building a command today, but then you get to space tactics and answering some of these very tough doctrinal questions. And just in general, uh, the distinct missions that you see as your priority as you step through the continuum of space missions that are out there for you to uh, satisfy. Yeah, so first let me, um, th there's been, and this is kind of common that um, people blur the, the lines between a U.S. Space Command and a U.S. Space Force. Okay. And I think one of the reasons why it was blurred is for the, for the first year it, I commanded the U.S. Space Command and was the service chief. Uh, but there's two distinct functions. One is the one that does the warfighting and conducts operations. And then on the Space Force side, we organize, train, and equip to provide those capabilities uh, to the combatant command. Um, our job is to make sure that I can provide the capabilities that the combatant commander needs to be able to, to and not just U.S. Space Command combatant commander, but all the combatant commanders that yeah. provide the capabilities that they need to conduct their missions on the, uh, and so, that's a full spectrum set of missions and it's you know everything from birth to to death i mean it, it's launching it's developing satellites launching those satellites making sure that they work when they get on orbit making sure that that they don't run into anything while they're on orbit that we can track them making sure that we can integrate those capabilities again sensor to, uh, integrating sensor and shooter and uh, across the joint and coalition force to protecting and defending those those capabilities while they're on orbit, which is largely new business uh, since the threat has emerged, and and then at the end of life, deorbiting those to keep the domain safe for all, and so that whole spectrum from from cradle to, to death is what we're focusing on, uh, and we're focusing on providing capabilities that that our nation needs again on for American way of life and for uh, American way of war, everything from you know, on, on the U.S. Space Force side, uh, uh, communications, uh, GPS, um, missile warning, space situational awareness, weather, uh, launch capabilities, uh, space control capabilities, that whole suite against that whole spectrum of operations. So, so I thought that asking a clunky question, trying to tie together three would help us get uh, that elaboration. So I really appreciate the distinction between your responsibilities for OT and E and, and that of the warfighting commanders. Um, with that, I will simply uh, wrap up as moderator and thanking you for the transparency and the willingness to uh, you know, pretty much touch on every topic that uh, the audience brought up today. I, I think I've exhausted my list of questions and you've been straight on with them. And so thank you for that. And James, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first off, General Raymond, thank you. That was one of the most informative discussions that we've had. The questions from the audience were outstanding. It's also one of our best attended webinars. And so clearly there is a strong interest in this. And I think that it represents the overlap between the private sector government and DOD and the importance of all of these partners for space. I think the distinction between Space Command and Space Force is exceptionally important, and I think that that answered an awful lot of questions. I'd also like to thank you, General Bender, for your moderation today. 
the uh, informed aspect that you bring to this was exceptional, and I, I appreciate that. Um, we may have some follow-ups with you in the future. We are very excited for you to have spent some time with us, and I know that the NDU students, faculty, and staff gained a lot from this. So thank you very, very much for all of this. To right. our audience, thank you for joining us. We'll have more sessions coming up after the beginning of the year. We are um, wrapped up mostly for this year. There's a very busy couple of months with a lot of other things happening, but we appreciate all of your participation and please feel free to follow up with suggested topics and other, other areas for us. Again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Admiral Rogi. Thank you to the foundation board members and to our sponsors for this series, Lidos and Via. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate the opportunity. I'd be happy to participate in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.